Hello and thank you for joining us on Life Questions. I'm your host, Bill Harris. As many of you know, our program focuses on pr providing you with answers to questions about life from a biblical perspective. And we accomplish that by enlisting the help of local ministers who carefully and prayerfully review your viewer questions to provide insightful scriptural answers. And they are here right now to give you an answer. These ministers include Pastor Chris Browning of the Shawnee Alliance Church, Pastor Paul Ross of One Church in Lima, Ohio, Pastor Craig, uh, Craig Flack of the Salina First Church of God, and rounding up our panel today is Pastor Dennis Gartner of New Knoxville United Methodist Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us. And uh, you know, we, we enjoyed you last week and let's see if we can't do it again, okay? <laughs> uh, the question we have to lead off with here, very interesting one and perhaps for our viewers will be setting the, the tone of something new that they've not heard before. Uh, a woman says that her, her, her husband has a friend who claims to be a deconstructing Christian, a deconstructing Christian. His reason for this is that he says that if God really, really loved everybody, why would he, why would he let everybody go to hell and burn forever? What, what, what do you, you said you've been hearing about deconstructing Christianity, huh? Yeah, it's uh, probably something more in the younger generation, so maybe uh, millennial, Gen Z. Um, the idea of deconstruction is simply that uh, I was taught a poor theology. Uh, people that have con are regularly deconstructing might say something like a toxic theology, a negative theology, and I'm going to deconstruct it. I'm going to take it apart. I'm going to examine it. Now, one might hear that and think, well, that's not so bad. I've, I've done that many times throughout. I've it shifted my theology here. I've brushed up. I've learned new things. But oftentimes, uh, if someone says they're deconstructing, it does not mean that they've then rebuilt the house with God's word and proper understanding. It often means that they're walking away from the faith, that they've deconstructed their faith. Mm -hmm. And so... However, anyone, there's probably no Webster's definition of it, but it's maybe more like demolishing uh, their faith. Very often folks don't say I'm deconstructing and then mean it as like, a, and I'm still trying to faithfully follow. They're really grappling and saying, I'm not sure if I really want to be a Christian anymore. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that's the heart of this person is as a person who is taking apart their faith, one of the reasons I'm struggling is because if God really loved everyone, why would anybody go to hell? Yeah. Well, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to combat that? How are we going to address that and still, um, still make a, 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 the, uh, the gospel attractive to people? One of, my, one of my favorite expressions of this answer actually comes from the Bible Project. And um, they do a really great job of visually you know, illustrating God's holiness. And that when you get close to God, it can become dangerous, not because God is bad or evil, but because God is so good that impurity, even, even ritual impurity, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. a sin to touch a dead body, but it was a sin to then be in that impure state and walk into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. That he is so good, he is so holy, that that becomes dangerous to our sin. And we see Jesus transform us. We see the Holy Spirit renew us and we walk differently. Um, but God won't be in the presence of sin. That's right. He will rescue the sinner. Mm -hmm. He will not be in the presence. He will right. not go to where our sin took us. Mm -hmm. He will pull us out. Mm -hmm. He won't dwell there in that muck with us. <clears throat> but the heart of the question is, why doesn't God do things the way I would? Uh, which I've That's asked. That's a question, you know. Well, well yeah, pastors don't look at people and say, man, I sure hope you go to hell. No. Like, well, not, <laughs> I hope not, right? <laughs> I, I, I've never looked at someone and said, you are so cruel to me, I hope that you go to hell. We don't get excited. No. But we're also not going to back away from God's holiness, his righteousness. Yes, he is loving, he is good, but he is also just. He also won't contradict himself. And he has given provision for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad when someone says, I'm trying to build my faith, not just what my parents taught me, not just what my pastor said, because we're fallible, <laughs> super mm -hmm. fallible. Um, I'm trying to make sense of it in scripture, in prayer, Good. 
but don't neglect the most basic doctrines of God's goodness and, yeah. and, and the problem of evil in the world. You know, lean into them, ask those questions, but then go answer them because that reconstruction, yeah. that can be powerful. A Christ follower who accepted Christ young and has built their faith around the scriptures, unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the points Revelation makes about heaven is the fact that nothing impure can dwell there. Nothing unrighteous will be there because God rejects sin. It's, it's important to me in the Bible when you see individuals get a vision of God, like in Isaiah 6 where the prophet Isaiah sees a vision of God sitting on his throne and immediately his response is, woe to me, I'm undone because mm -hmm. I'm a sinner. Yeah. In Luke uh, chapter 5, when, uh, G when Peter is in his boat and Jesus says, cast the nets over there. And, he, and they come up with this miraculous catch and Peter falls to his knees in front of Jesus mm -hmm. and says, leave me for I am a sinner. Yeah. So the idea that, uh, that somehow God can be connected with sin is just totally rejected in Scripture. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you know, when you, when, for me when I'm reading this, I see a shift from spirit control to flesh. And we know in Second John, it says, everything that is not of God, love not the world, okay? Right, right. For the things that are of the world are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, the eyes, eyes, and, and the, the pride, pride of life. Of life. It means any of those things separates you from God. So when someone is going along this line, what it tells me is there's a drifting that happens. And we know in Jeremiah 29 and 13, it says, if you seek me, you will find me. But here's the caption, if you seek me with all, all your heart. heart. So f the, 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 the walk of God requires faith. Mm -hmm. And faith has to be present for it, the connection to occur. Right. When that faith is removed, this is what happens. We start reasoning on the self, reasoning with the flesh, mm -hmm. reasoning in the, mm -hmm. in the natural. And we see a generation that is reasoning from their self. Yeah. You know, Hebrews 11 and 6, what does that say? It says, without faith, not it is hard or difficult, it's but impossible. it says it's impossible to please God. Yeah, yeah. And so I, my heart and my prayer for this individual is, you know, seek after God because he said he'll, he'll meet you. When there's a heart that says, I want to know God for who he is. Yeah. You, you he give some great, through. thank you. you. You give some great explanations. I wonder sometimes, do we, not meaning to do so, but slip into our intellectualism. You, you, I think you said, why, why can't God see it my way? It's what you, you said earlier, you know. Recreating that thing. God in our own Yeah, image. yeah. Why can't that. God, you know, why can't he come by me? You know, he, he didn't, he never ran that by me, you know. <laughs> Our intellectualism gets in the way and God says, I, I'm not like you. He says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. You know, he's not limited to time and space like we are. He's outside of all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but to try to get a person to understand that, you know, I can't understand why God would send people to hell. It isn't God sending people to hell. Right. It, it's, it's, it's the behavior. You know, how do we... Is it that we need to harp on it more so we can get people to understand it? How do we get people to understand it? Exactly what you're saying. You know, I give the example with my own kids and I tell them, listen, dad loves you. Mom loves you. But obedience, the scripture says better than sacrifice. Yes. My love for you will not prevent you from being hurt. Yes. If you run out in the traffic yes. and into oncoming yes. traffic yes. or jump off of a building mm -hmm. and gravity takes hold, the law of gravity overrides my love for yes. you. And the spiritual law, yeah. the spiritual law that's in work, God himself will not override that. We have got to come his way. We have got to come his path, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. And our goal isn't punting to mystery. There are aspects of this that I think if all of us around this table are honest, we don't fully get the why either. Absolutely. And and we don't mean to punt the mystery and just say, oh, well, you know, God, God is going gonna to do what God does. We just got to deal with it. Because for the person who's going through this process, mm -hmm. for the agnostic, for the atheist, mm -hmm. that's that means nothing. But to say, you know, our faith is inherently personal. 
And, and so it starts with the person of Jesus Christ. He must authenticate the scriptures. He must, he must show us truth, revelation. And if we don't have that, no, it's not going to make sense. But for this person, first of all, the person who's speaking to this, you know, with the questions, thank you. Yeah. Keep talking. Keep expressing love. Keep giving space for people to have an issue. I, I can read the Old Testament. I can read parts of the New Testament and go, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right. For all the forgiveness, you know, they didn't give all their money. And really, that seems a little harsh, God. But, <laughs> but I have to be honest about that and be invited into that process with Jesus where, you know, it's not going to matter when I get to heaven. On this side of heaven, it matters. And his presence has to be enough. Mm -hmm. But I can't get there until I've actually seen him. I've actually, you know, been able to be with him. Mm -hmm. Then his presence mm -hmm. means enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Well, I, I wonder, is it fair to say that when we think about God, if all we think about is a loving God, we haven't thought about all that God is? Because can't we also agree that there is a justice with God? Mm -hmm. There is a, um, a wrath. I mean, the, uh, over, over and over in the Bible, we read about the wrath of God. And sometimes the tendency, I think, is to reduce the entire word of God to the statement that God is love, and that means he can't be wrathful. Mm -hmm. a and I don't read it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was someone yeah. that said, uh, uh, it was a, a televangelist who had uh, grifted a lot of people out of money, and he was being interviewed by a pastor in prison. And, he, and the pastor asked him, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? And he said, oh, I love Jesus the whole time. And he said, well, no, you didn't. You, you grifted all these folks. You stole. You tax fraud. And this is not a, a, a parable. This is a true story. And the pastor said, no, I love Jesus. I stopped fearing God. Oh, I God. had a love, but there was no more fear mm. that the Lord would bring down for yes. my hypocrisy, for my, my wrongdoings, anything negative on my life. And I thought, yeah, that's, that actually can hit can home never, a little bit. Yeah. Well, and let's not redefine love to what we want it to be. You know, when, when we're looking at biblical love, you know, God gets to define that. And love is just. Love is, you, you know, it, it brings about uh, freedom for the imprisoned. It brings about restoration for those. We can't... We, so yes, fully loving and fully just and fully righteous. And these things don't come into conflict until we redefine the terms and recreate in our own image, I think. All right. Oh, uh, 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 can you hold your point just a minute? Absolutely. I want to take a quick break and uh, we'll come back in a few moments. There's so much more to discuss here. <laughs> we'll come right back to you, Pastor, right after this. Stay with us. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Well, thank you for staying with us. And uh, for those of you who may have just joined us, we're talking about uh, a relatively new concept that we're hearing about, and that is the deconstructing of Christianity. And all that deals and entails the, the, really the, the, the dismantling of Christianity, as some would like to, and then not reconstructing to get near God to, to any extent. And uh, Pastor Ross, you, you had a question, or not a question, you had a statement you wanted to make to address that. Uh, centered basically on the crucifixion, right? Absolutely. The individual asked, uh, why would a just God allow people to burn in hell for eternity? And the fact of the matter is when Christ was on that cross, after being be beaten and brutalized and beyond recognition, beyond recognition. Uh, just before he died, he cried out, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, the sin that he took on yes. for the world was enough to block him from the father and that? it is so significant that we see that picture because he took on the sins so that we don't have to carry mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. and in that moment it was the demonstration of the gospel so after that if we don't take the gospel that serious we're saying that that crucifixion was not really important and, yeah, and that it wasn't valid and, and and well they didn't th that they failed to take advantage of it yes and even the person that asked the question, why do I have to burn in hell throughout eternity? I come, it just can't be for a moment and then I can get 
into you, you, God's graces. Uh, and, but they're negating the fact that there was an opportunity because uh, the people who don't know or hear the gospel, they, they get a chance on earth to accept it before. Amen. The great C.S. Lewis wrote uh, a book called The Great Divorce. If viewers are interested in reading that, I, I, love won't, him, but I won't get into it now, but he, he tackles this question uh, in The Great Divorce. So All right. something, to, something to add for extra, a little homework. Yeah. Pastors love to sign uh, extra readings. So. <laughs> All right, well, then let's move on here. Another question that comes in from viewers. I made a lot of mistakes as a teenager. While I have since returned to my faith in Jesus, I just don't know how to break free from the shame of my past. That's that's terrible. That's a bondage. That, that denotes a bondage that's still there. Shame is one of those things that I'll, I'll remind people, you know, conviction says I've done a bad thing. I need to return to the Lord. And uh, we all feel convicted over different things. Mm -hmm. Shame says I am a bad thing. Shame tells you that you are wrong, that mm -hmm. you are broken. Mm -hmm. And we can look back on our past and when we feel conviction or a burden, we should be able to return and give that to God. But when we feel that shame, we can feel like, well, I'm not worthy to go into the presence of the Lord. I'm not worthy to take this to him. And when I've wrestled with that, because we all have, I, I guarantee you every pastor sitting there right before they get up to preach going, Lord, why am I like what I did this past week, what I thought, what I said now, and you feel ashamed. It's in that moment, preaching the gospel to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, are you worthy of the gospel to be preached? If you had a friend come to you over coffee and say, boy, I messed up. Do you think God loves me? They'd say, of course he does. He, his, his son died for you. He forgives you. He'd run to you. But then that same person to apply that same gospel to themselves, they mm -hmm. allow their own shame to block yeah. that. So one of my counsels to people is believe the gospel that you preach. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to yeah. believe that gospel yeah. that you yeah. preach. It's the shame. It's the same shame. <laughs> Say that five times. Mm -hmm. It's the same shame that Adam felt when he, yep. he and Eve ran and hid in those bushes, isn't Covers it? Covers himself from the Lord. Yeah. It's the same shame. Yeah. And, and what, what happens there? The first death recorded in the Bible is an animal that God kills to clothe Adam and Eve. That's right. Yep. That the consequence of their sin, even before we had the sacrificial mm -hmm. system, even before we had the Levitical priests, mm -hmm. before all that, mm -hmm. God showed up for Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. God was tremendously gracious. And that's what I would say to the person suffering from shame. You know, God desires to be gracious in this forgiveness. And I get it. I think that for any of us who have done wrong, you know, even in an earthly way, we, we desire for that person to know how contrite we are, how sorry we are, how we wish it had never happened. Mm -hmm. And these mistakes, I don't know what they are. And I don't, I don't care. I care about the person. I don't care about what the mistakes are. Forgiveness is forgiveness. It's complete and total. Just because we can't get it perfect doesn't mean God didn't. You know? And God has moved beyond he desires yes. for this person to just be able to, to grow and be confident in that relationship. And when there's that moment of conviction, I love that. Like, that is a gift from God to return us into his presence. And we should never be ashamed of that conviction. It should be guiding. It should be important. But, yeah, let's not live there. Let's, let's not rob mm -hmm. more of our life, you know, from Jesus. Can we ask you this on top of that? If a person goes on a long, long, long time with this shame and refuses to forgive himself or herself, does it at some point turn into a matter of selfish pride? Mm. Mm. You think? Yeah, not letting, um, again, not, not believing this, that the gospel is sufficient for you. So when we take uh, communion, uh, I remind our church family that the blood of Christ is sufficient for all sins. You're not a butterfly. You're not special. You're not unique. Now, you'd like to believe that, and your mommy told you that when you were growing up, but we can look at our own sin and say, um, well, God couldn't love me because I did this. Either the blood of Jesus Christ is indeed perfect, or it is not. Mm -hmm. So it didn't come to, you know, Pastor Craig and say, well, I haven't accounted for this, this knucklehead. You know, I was good for all of human history, but when I got to this man, when I got to this woman, I, I wasn't there. And that's a tongue-in-cheek way. When we feel that, it can, it can be hard, but we just have to remind ourselves of that truth of like, God didn't come to me, and then suddenly Jesus wasn't sufficient for me. I promise you, Jesus right. is sufficient mm -hmm. for all of us. Mm -hmm. right. Very well you put. know, I, I think of the saying, when, when someone comes to you and show you your past, just show them 
your future in Christ. And, you know, I think of Romans 8, if anyone be in Christ, no, there is therefore now no condemnation no. for no. those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. No That's condemnation. Right. No in other words, don't look in the rear view mirror. I told the, the congregation a couple of weeks ago, you know, the enemy loved to sit in the back seat and make faces in the <laughs> rear view mirror. We've got to keep our eyes forward, Amen. you know, because that's how we keep moving. Don't be distracted because what happens if we keep looking in that mirror? We're going to wreck the car. <laughs> and that's really what this comes down to. And so we've got to look forward. We've got to keep our eyes on God and understand once he's forgiven us, there's therefore now no more condemnation mm -hmm. right. for Amen. those things in the past. And the scriptures just keep jumping in on that point. First John 1, 9, where it says, confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us our us. sins. And the word that's used is cleanse us, but it means continuously cleansing, uh, uh. daily, hourly. That blood of Christ Say never it. stops working on us. Say that. The next chapter talks about how we have an advocate mm -hmm. if anyone has sinned. And it doesn't say we had an advocate. It says we yeah, have one. Ongoing. Yeah. When we sin, yeah. he uh, intervenes for us before the Father in heaven. And First John 1, 9. If we confess, God is faithful and just right. to cleanse us from all sin mm -hmm. and make pure in us mm -hmm. all in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So what is the, the variable there? Yeah. If we, yeah. then God. Mm -hmm. That's a promise. So the variable is us, not God. So if this sister is taken, I believe it was a, a woman, um, if she's taken those steps, then God's promises are good. Yeah. Amen. And, Amen. And you, you can love Jesus and have a really good counselor. Like if this is keeping you from growing in faith, mm -hmm. please, like, <laughs> please, you can love Jesus, be fully committed to the gospel, yes. and you can have a professional who helps you walk through these things. Yeah, yeah. So if shame is holding you back from, from experiencing mm -hmm. life to its fullest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Please, yes, talk to your pastor, talk to your Christian friends. Please don't be afraid. Like, go and seek that help. We have great resources here in the area, even with Cornerstone of Hope Christian Counseling. You can get some really good Christ-centered help to be able to process it in a healthy way mm -hmm. and to be able to see God's grace and his forgiveness and to move forward in, in, in a redeemed and a really Amen. meaningful way. Amen. That ought to do it. All right. Let's move on. Uh, another question, gentlemen. Um, a viewer writes, I have been dealing with illness for a long time. I have been told that I am sick because of a sin in my life. But I read the Bible, but I read the Bible every day and am seeking God's plan for my life. Why am I still sick? To be honest, I'm starting to doubt that God wants to help me. Uh, wh what about that? You know, what came to mind when I was thinking is um, the blind man that Jesus heals and Absolutely. his disciples ask him, who sinned in this man's past? His daddy, his mom, his parents, yeah. or was it him? And Jesus said, no one sinned, but this man was born like this so that the power of God may be revealed in him. Mm -hmm. And I've often reflected in that moment, and then Jesus heals him, and there's, that blind man might have been sitting there thinking, what? I didn't ask for the power of God to be revealed to me. I just, you yeah. know, I just wanted a normal life. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask mm -hmm. for that. There are times when we face afflictions that the Lord is do, going to give us something so that his power can be revealed in us or through us and it might challenge us, it might be very difficult, it might be very hard, it was clear. I would, I would say lovingly back that I don't see in the scriptures that it is a, a sin that is likely made this person sick. Now the Lord might reveal to them and bring conviction in some way, but if they've honestly sought their heart, then I think sometimes we need to be really careful saying that to someone oh, just absolutely. broadly, because they've laid a burden on that person. If they're saying, I have read my Bible daily and I seek God's plan, I don't think God hides his, when he's bringing discipline over an issue. Mm -hmm. So if this person doesn't feel that, there may be another reason, and it might be that God has a, a path for you to walk out that is challenging and hard, but it will be an opportunity to bring glory to his name. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any comment on that? Okay. Be mindful of the people in your life who are telling you, well, if you just found this secret sin, then you'd be fixed. But that's to Job's friends. There's a whole book. Exactly. There's a whole book of the Bible. And, and just be, be, be conscientious who you're allowing to speak into you because, you know, there might be some, some, some Christ-centered repentance to be done, as most of us have, yeah. you know, on a regular basis. Um, God's with you. God unmutes a good book. 
to look at, but goodness gracious, you know, the person looking at you just saying, well, if you just clean up your life a little bit, everything be perfect. Bet that person dies one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I get frustrated. <laughs> That's, it's just junk. It's just junk, and it's and it's born from a false theology that Job dealt with very handily, mm -hmm. and God dealt with mm -hmm. in Job. Mm -hmm. I have heard of cases where Christians walk into a hospital room and basically make that very claim. Mm -hmm. I know why you're here. I know why you're sick. I know why you're hospitalized. It's because you've sinned. It's exactly what Job's friends did and were condemned for it at the end of the book, if you remember. And it's similar to what Jesus said in Luke 13. Remember, there were two current events. Somebody said, well, there were some worshipers in Jerusalem and Pilate mm -hmm. sent soldiers and massacred them at the temple. And then there was another event, the Tower of Siloam fell down. There were innocent people walking down the sidewalk and they were killed. The, the tendency is for the person not injured to say, oh, those must have been pretty bad sinners, worse than I am. And Jesus said, don't think that way unless you repent, you will also perish. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, lesson is that God's grace isn't free, it isn't deserved, we have to be uh, repentant, we have to turn to God, and then that grace is administered to us. And we live in a fallen world with yeah. illness yeah. and yeah. sickness, and yeah. it's difficult. We've got about 90 seconds, a little less. Here's a question maybe we can deal with in a minute and a half. Uh, we're now several months into the new year. I tried to do the Bible in a year program, that is reading the Bible in one year program, in January, but I have fallen so far behind. I feel like a failure. Should I still try to catch up so that I can finish in one year? You got 60 seconds to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not necessary to, to put that type of burden in. I mean, it goes right back to what we were saying. There's therefore now no condemnation. Amen. Dust off, pick up the Bible, and just Amen. keep going forward. <laughs> Read more than last year. Yeah. They keep reading until you go see Jesus, then he'll take care of it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And don't, don't feel like a failure. We all have fits and starts and stops. Put your hand to the plow and start again. Absolutely. When your kid falls off your bike, you don't Get scream at them and say, how dare you? Yeah. You say, all right, we're going to pedal a little better next yeah. time. Very quick. We have to, Navigators see. has a free Bible reading plan that's flexible. You don't have to meet the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amen. Well, that'll do it. That'll do it. Thank you. Gentlemen, it's been, it's been terrific this week and last week as well. And we need to take this show on the road. You know? There we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. And we're out of time. And uh, we'll be back again next week at this same time uh, with a brand, new, uh, a brand new crew here to answer questions and the like. So be, be, uh, stay tuned and we'll see you next week. Okay? Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.